Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. I'm Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. David, all about the DeFi mullet today. We had Kai Sheffield, and we had Diogo Monica from Visa and Anchorage, respectively, and they know what they're talking about with respect to fintech and payments. They are from the companies that work with all of the companies in these fields. Uh, what a fantastic discussion we had. I really liked the uh, this the back and forths that Kai and, and Diogo had. Their, their deny, dynamic between them as guests was phenomenal. And I think that actually lends itself to the dynamic between their companies, right? There's a lot of back and forth between Visa and Anchorage. One really isn't complete without the other. Visa is this gargantuan payment network, whereas Anchorage does all the custody for all the things being transacted. So together, they really illustrate a very complete picture of what it looks like to do payments, to do custody in the fintech world and really have a very deep understanding of the problem set that exists with TradFi integrating crypto and crypto payments and how to solve and route around those problems and really create a new payments paradigm that's based off of these new global payment rails. Yeah, you know, one of the themes from the conversation was um, Diego was talking about this fork in the world in in the road where previously crypto has been thought of as mainly a retail sort of phenomenon and retail yep. use cases, and that has changed. It's it's now not just retail. Now there's a massive business to business side of things that uh, is being tapped into, and like the value proposition of crypto within the fintech and payments industry is now we're we're talking 2021 is now self evident so it's no longer the the champion internally who's struggling to help his or her organization understand crypto now they all get it and so this episode may be incredibly bullish on the next steps that fintech is going to take in crypto. We already knew coming into this, David, that the uh, the exchanges of the world, the crypto banks as we call them, were becoming a bit more like fintech. And now we're very clearly seeing, and I think this podcast illustrates how fintech is coming closer to crypto as well. Um, yeah, it's just a really fascinating discussion. That was a key takeaway to me. And another cool takeaway to me was actually having Kai explain how Visa payments work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like mm -hmm. when you go and you buy your Starbucks coffee, right, what's actually happening in the background? And if you buy it in Europe, how are the banks interacting and how does Visa sit on top of that? And where is payment actually settled? And we, I think we made some cool analogies between how that world works in the traditional world to how crypto wor works that um, have really helped me understand things. So that was cool as well. Yeah, f such a fantastic learning lesson right then. And one of the mental models I have for this space is that like, Bitcoin, Ethereum, crypto at large, it's like a mind virus, right? It's got its tentacles going everywhere. And the more tentacles it has, the more it can grab and, and pull itself in. Uh, and what is Visa other than something with the most integrations, the most bridges to almost everything in the world? And it's, it's a huge milestone for Visa to successfully integrate to payment rails on crypto and bridge them to the entire rest of the world. Uh, and so like this, this growing Leviathan that is crypto is really like now reaching inside of Visa to access Visa's network to grow to the rest of the world, which, you know, just makes me bullish, makes me bullish. Absolutely. And I think we're going to talk about this more in the debrief because one of the themes I want to talk to you about, David, is something I was struck with is, oh my God, this is so inevitable. Now you get these major fintechs and institutions on board, Visa's on board. Okay. With people concerned about regulation. Okay. These guys, these institutions aren't going to let regulation happen in a negative way for their investments. They see the value proposition that they could bring. So if you guys want to tune into that full conversation that David and I are about to have, stay tuned for the debrief that is available for premium members and you could subscribe. There's a link in your show notes. With that, I think we should get to the interview, but before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. Matcha, everyone's favorite DEX aggregator, has just launched an open beta for gasless trading. So if you're trading more than $5,000 in common ETH and wrapped Bitcoin pairs, then your gas fees on Matcha are free. And that's why you should be using Matcha. Matcha routes your orders across all the various DeFi exchanges on Ethereum, 
Polygon, Binance Smart Chain, and gives you the best possible price without any trading fees or unnecessary slippage. Matcha has smart order routing that splits your orders across multiple liquidity sources if Matcha sees that, that it gets you better pricing. Trading on Matcha is super easy because it pulls the liquidity for me into a single and easy to use platform and has even saved me multiple times from accidentally picking the wrong decks to trade on and getting a bad price. Matcha also allows you to make limit orders on chain so you can set and forget your DeFi trades and they will go through automatically while you're away. So when you're making a trade, head over to matcha.xyz slash bankless, connect your wallet, and start getting some of the best prices and most liquidity when you trade your crypto assets. Alchemix is one of the coolest new DeFi apps on the scene. It introduces self-paying loans, allowing you to spend and save at the same time. Deposit the DAI stablecoin into the Alchemix vault in order to get an advance on the interest it generates. Borrow up to 50% of the total amount of your deposited DAI in the form of AL-USD stablecoin. Here's the craziest part. The loan pays itself back and you cannot be liquidated. Unlock your assets potential in the ultimate DeFi savings account. And brand new to Alchemix is the ETH vault where you can deposit ETH into the application, borrow AL ETH against your deposits while having your advance gradually paid back over time. V2 is rapidly approaching, which will allow for even more collateral types, plus a variety of yield strategies to choose from. Harness the power of Alchemix at alchemix.fi. That's A-L-C-H-E-M-I-X dot F-I. Follow Alchemix on Twitter at alchemixfi and join the Discord to keep up to date with Alchemix V2 and to get involved in governance. Bankless Nation, we are super excited about this episode. What is fintech doing in crypto? That is the question today. It's a thread we've talked a lot about at Bankless, but I feel like we haven't pulled on quite enough. Well, today we're doing that. What are the squares, the stripes, the PayPals, the visas doing? It seems like they've woken up to crypto here recently. They've got hundreds of millions of customers. They've perfected many things, user acquisition, user experience. So what are their plans? we got to figure that out. We have Kai Sheffield, who is the head of crypto at Visa. Of course, you know Visa. They issue those plastic cards you carry around with you in your pocket. Kai is one of the biggest crypto champions I know, certainly the biggest in Visa. We also have Diogo Monica, who is the uh, co-founder and president of Anchorage Digital. Anchorage is kind of a bridge between the fintechs I was just talking about and large institutions. They do crypto custody, they do DeFi stuff, everything that the fintechs can't do currently. Gentlemen, it's great to have you. Welcome to Bankless. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, fantastic. Let's start here. You know, David and I uh, have a thesis that we we talk about a lot at Bankless, and this came about like a year ago from a, a blog post uh, I wrote in the Bankless newsletter. This is called the DeFi mullet thesis, guys. All right. And I want, run a, want to run this by, uh, by you guys. So last year at about this time, we started noticing that many of the, the fintechs were playing a lot in the crypto space, starting to talk uh, much more about crypto. You know, the Stripes, the Robin Hoods, the Plaids, the Ants, the, the Squares. Our comment at the time was like, fintech is kind of user experience, but it's still almost like lipstick on a pig. And the pig is the banking system, right? The fax machines and the the old legacy pro payment processing system that underlies this thing. And what we observed last year is, what's really interesting is the top five apps, uh, fintech apps at the time, um, they were all like supporting crypto, right? Uh, the banks were below them, but the top apps all supporting crypto, fintech apps, uh, were, were um, you know, were, were doing the crypto thing. And so we came up with this, this concept, this thesis, as we call it, which is what we call the DeFi mullet thesis, okay? So this is fintech in the front. You got the bank in the front. Everything looks nice in the front, but the party's in the back, right? You have DeFi in the back. And our thesis at the time, and still is, and I think it's played out over the last year a bit more, is that this is how the fintechs would come to crypto. They would sort of perfect the user acquisition, but they would slowly start to replace that old legacy crusty banking payments layer with crypto, okay? So I want to ask both of you because I feel like, uh, you know, you have the front row seats here. You would know better than us what's actually going on. What are your thoughts on the DeFi mullet thesis? Are you believers? Uh, Kai, why don't we start with you? Sure. So I, I'm definitely a, a believer in the mullet thesis and am a proud uh, mullet you know, myself. Uh, so I, I see, I think you kind of have to start with what's been happening with crypto companies, 
where I think many years ago, crypto companies weren't really a part of the, the fintech conversation. It was kind of seen as this separate thing. You had these crypto wallets and exchanges. You know, they weren't really considered you know, fintechs uh, in the popular sense. And then these companies, you know, the exchanges like Coinbase and, and FTX and others, were growing rapidly. And they were acquiring customers. You know, they were getting billions of dollars of assets on their platforms. And you know, they started to get pretty ambitious and, and look to expand and to get into payments themselves. And so that's what we really saw first was when we set up our crypto product team in 2019, it was because we recognized that crypto exchanges and wallets had the potential to become major players in the fintech and payment ecosystem. And they were looking to start to build products like debit cards and credit cards and giving you know, more traditional fintech and payment features to the core you know, customer bases that they had acquired and that they had a ton of engagement uh, and activity on their platforms. And so we started working very closely you know, with these crypto wallets, helping with fiat on-ramps and fiat off-ramps and, and kind of giving them a path and a bridge to start to look more like you know, crypto native neobanks. And I think that was really the first piece that you know, crypto companies were coming more into fintech and banking. And then you had you know, neobanks and traditional fintechs you know, recognizing the success that crypto companies were having you know, with their core crypto features and saying, wait a minute, shouldn't we be incorporating crypto into our core products? And so we think these two worlds are going to continue to intersect more and more. Oh, I totally agree with that, by the way. And th that's something we've been saying for a long time. In fact, like uh, two, two and a half years ago on Bankless, we started calling what everyone used to call an exchange, a crypto bank. All right. We used this, you know, the small lowercase b for crypto bank, but we started to recognize that hey, it's not just about trading. That's what an exchange does. But these crypto banks, the Coinbases and Geminis and Binances and FTXs of the world, they're going to move into all of the other money verbs, including one money verb that I know you guys are interested, Kai, which is which is payments. But let mm -hmm. me ask you a question before we get to uh, Diego's um, take on this. Um, do you and does Visa sort of see that as an opportunity or a threat with the crypto banks, you know, becoming more like fintech and and um, entering into, say, the payment scene? Well, how do you guys view that? We think it's a tremendous opportunity, and I think really the the challenge that that we see and that I think a lot of crypto companies have recognized is we're a long way from direct merchant acceptance of transactions over public blockchain networks. And there are a lot of challenges for them to do that, you know, particularly in, in the brick and mortar you know, merchant ecosystem. You know, we know how difficult it is to get merchants to add new acceptance points at the point of sale, and then to get consumers to change behavior where you're used to buying coffee, you know, tapping uh, your phone with Apple Pay, and now you know, you're supposed to you know, scan a QR code, which is not particularly in the US, not really a form factor that most customers are familiar with. Plus, you have the challenge that crypto is increasingly becoming fragmented in multi-protocol. And so if you have many different blockchains, and now you have many different second layers, just this idea of accepting crypto, what does it mean for a merchant? You know, what's, Let's say you want to accept USDC. Are you going to accept USDC on Ethereum, on Solana, on Stellar, on Algorand, on Arbitrum? Like, how do you have the right QR code, the right acceptance point? Do I have to tell the merchant which network I want to pay with USDC over and they have to give me the right QR code for it? We think it's going to be a long time before most merchants have the capability and most consumers are changing behavior to the point where they would want to transact directly. And so the value that Visa provides is you can have the same familiar experience of tapping to pay with a Visa credential, whether virtual or physical, that works at 70 million merchants across the world. You don't have to ask the merchant, do you accept crypto? Do you accept this network? And have to go through extra steps. It just works. And now you can have that credential pull from a balance of a stable coin, from a balance of a crypto asset. And so it gives you access to liquidity of the assets that you have, but without a merchant having to change a single thing. And so we think for the next several years, we're going to see you know, most major crypto wallets start to bring to market you know, crypto linked debit and credit card products that consumers you know, are really 
excited about and are starting to use them and use them at scale. And we think that's a huge opportunity of, of for growth in our business. So a tremendous opportunity for Kai that Visa sees in the uh, the DeFi mullet. Uh, what about you, Diego? So you've got a broader aperture. You're not just looking at Visa, but you're working with a lot of these fintechs and institutions at Anchorage. Uh, are you a believer in the DeFi mullet thesis? And do you see it? Pl- how do you see it playing out with other fintechs? I'm definitely a believer in the DeFi mullet. Love the analogy. I will also point out that if there are pictures of Kai uh, with a mullet, I would love to see them. That <laughs> oh, we would can, actually that be... can be arranged, sir. We can make these. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, Kai is such a believer that at some point in his life, he must have supported one. And so I really want to see those. That's the mental model that I have throughout this whole conversation is Kai with a mullet. Uh, so without that, uh, let's just, uh, you know, I, I, I genuinely believe that um, the DeFi mullet works uh, because what's happening is is the following. It is for these fintechs, win, win, win. The first win for the fintechs is that regardless of the crypto products themselves, when you add crypto as a feature to your platform, folks like Square have figured out that it increases engagement in all of the other products that they have built into the product. So that is the first win. You just, by adding crypto and by adding a feature, you increase engagement. And if you have loops, strong network effects or strong loops, every single user that comes to participate in this feature stays for the network. So that is extremely important in the first win. The second win is a square cache is proven and love to see that they're constantly still to this day impresses me every time they're on the app store number one on the the finance section, you know, makes me particularly proud. Uh, But it's really interesting that square has proven that they can make a lot of money with this and that there's high revenue potential of adding crypto products and obviously uh, trading and um, offering uh, crypto services to consumers so that's the second win the first win is obviously engagement in current products second win is revenue and the last win is public publicly traded companies companies that are on the market there's definitely a recognition of the market that is valuable for them for them to be innovative and for them to actually be on the bleeding edge so the same way that when you add blockchain to your name your stock rises adding a crypto strategy that is legitimate not just lip service also increases the market cap of the company so think about this win 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 what is on the other side of the balance on the other side of the balance it's just been that it is different it is weird for the majority of these large players and People believe that there was some regulatory risk or some risks of them actually adding this to their platforms. And that is proven not to be the case uh, over and over and over again, especially as companies start becoming regulated. You know, Anchorage is the first and only federally chartered crypto bank. So there is a bank that can actually do custody, can do uh, staking, can do governance of all these DeFi protocols. That is just the, the clarity that these institutions need. And so now that we have removed the potential downside, it really is just win, win, win. And thus every single fintech will go down this path. And the ones that don't will just find themselves losing. Do you know, Diogo, I think we're starting to observe this in real time. David and I, we do a weekly show we call The Roll-Up, which is like a rundown of things happening in crypto. And we were just observing the uh, the PayPal earnings report that just came out with their quarterly earnings, you know, uh, 13% revenue growth, something like this. And all they could talk about was crypto. Okay, like, it's just like, uh, you know, what else would the fintechs talk about if not crypto these days? It's it's they're getting almost. We often say in Bankless, um, you know, crypto pays you to learn about crypto, right? Like I, we mean that literally, right? Number goes up, airdrops come in, um, more opportunity comes your way. Well, it's starting to pay these large fintechs to learn about it early as well, and that's why I'm sure it benefits uh, Visa from being on the cutting edge. Um, but of those three points, those three wins that you just mentioned, Diego, I get the revenue piece and I get the last piece. Tell me a bit more about the uh, the engagement piece, because that's kind of new to me. Why does adding crypto to a fintech platform, a Venmo or Square or Stripe or whatever else, why does that actually increase engagement in customer retention? Yeah, we can definitely try to guess why that is, um, and but but the reality is that it does, and so the outcome is obvious. And since the outcome is obvious, everybody's trying to follow. And I will point out that these platforms have also seen the same type of behavior from the majority of the features that they add to the platform. The flashier the feature, or the most interesting the feature, the highest engagement they get on these other core portions of their product. And so think about it less of a crypto specific component, but the fact that crypto is so 
Um, so, so obviously something that people want to talk about. And so obviously something that is marketable, I think it increases further than just traditional product features that you'd add that incremental. It feels like it's a step function. It feels like it's something that is obviously bringing in the millennials and bringing in people with connection to crypto. And thus this becomes your home and you're a lot likelier to use these other products that Square and PayPal and all these other players are using because now they're part of your crew. So there's this, uh, is getting like ahead a, of the pack a coolness factor right it's like there is cool definitely a coolness the factor yeah i mean there is there is <laughs> a coolness factor in. of the mullet mullets are in uh, <laughs> absolutely in and in the public markets they're clearly in uh, but also for consumers they're in and so really there's no downside to this it is an obvious strategy at this point it's been proven over and over and over and it really is win 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 yeah, so so one thing maybe i i would add on this is that you know I feel like for a long time people in fintech and people in banking they they looked at crypto and the volatility and it was a bug. It was like, oh, this this asset class is, is super volatile. And then at some point, the switch turned where a product manager who's responsible for how many daily active users can we get in our mobile app looked at crypto's volatility and was like, this is a feature that people are <laughs> opening their crypto apps to check the prices a lot more than they're opening opening their bank mobile apps ah, to check the balance. I have not heard that take and, before. And I think volatility is is a major driving factor of that. That it's fun and interesting and exciting, and it's got this just repeated consumer behavior. And if you could take someone opening your app multiple times a day, each time they open the app is a touch point where you can then be able to try and push them into another product, upsell and be able to build that loyal customer base. And I think that's something that we're starting to see. Kai, some might say another word for engagement then is addiction. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of the people uh, listening can can relate mm -hmm. in the number of times they check their block folio and mm -hmm. crypto prices during a given day. No, but I'll uh, jump in and say that uh, it really speaks to this competition for your home base, right? This one app that you have to use across all of your finances. It's not just about equities, it's about equities in crypto and your cash and all of it from one place. And all these fintechs now are in competition with one another. So once somebody adds something that I wanna check on my portfolio to their home screen, I have one less incentive to go open some other application that only gives me a, a slice of my, my my whole exposure or my whole um, um, my whole market exposure, right? And so once you start thinking about it that way and we're competing, you need to include everything. You need this super set because not including something means that the engagement will go somewhere else. And yes, Kai's absolutely right. The volatility is one of the aspects of um, how much um, how much have I made today or how much have I lost today. There's there's both those components that we see on Wall Street bets uh, that are human elements that are definitely at play here. And I think there's also this notion of just the consumer demand. What a lot of people don't realize is banks and, and fintechs, they can see that directly, even if they don't have crypto in their core products. They see how much money flows from their consumers to a Coinbase or Crypto.com or an FTX. You know, they see the card volume, they see the ACH volume. And so it's it's very clear to just say, okay, there's a trend here my consumers are interested in these products. They're sending funds out of my core product to a third party that's offering access to crypto. And I think that there's this, this fear that what if they don't come back? And it was one thing when they were sending money to a third party that was providing access to crypto, and that was it. And they were only providing access to crypto. You're always gonna come back for your debit card and for your credit card and for your loans. But now that those companies that they're sending money to that provide access to crypto are offering debit cards, are offering lending products, like there's the potential that they build a new relationship. And so, you know, with that data and that insight, plus the benefit that you get from engagement, it's because it, it becomes a very strong business case uh, for, you know, for thinking uh, fintechs and, and banks to say this should be a part of our product roadmap. So there's the carrot, but there's also the stick of like, what if they don't need us anymore? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely right. In this uh, fight for who's your home base, every single, every single company is competing for it. The same way that we were saying that every tech company becomes a fintech, now every fintech will become a crypto company. So that is a very clear flow because all of them will have to have these types of, these types of products. And it's particularly interesting, Kai's point around volatility. There's one aspect here that people are um, adding to their platform and also realizing that it has massive advantages, which is there's a lot of different products being added. But if for a moment, if you think about crypto rewards on credit card, so credit card rewards that are crypto based, so 
Bitcoin, um, cash back equivalents, things like that. There's an interesting phenomenon that is happening here, which is people only really feel the upside. And what I mean by that is the following. The volatility of crypto is bad because if you invest $1,000 and now it's worth 500, you have lost effectively $500. But now if somebody's giving you something for free instead of airline miles and points, if somebody's giving you crypto, the volatility means that you're incredibly excited because you got something for free that is a lot more valuable today. And if it goes down, there's not as much of that sting of this was actually my, my money that was invested here. And so the volatility for something like uh, crypto credit card rewards only really works in one direction, which is on the way up. And that is just absolutely fascinating as a phenomenon that then drives engagement, new types of products. And it can really help people with savings, exposure to an asset class for free in a dollar cost average way just by using a Visa credential. How beautiful is that, that we're helping people in a way um, include their savings and exposure to a very high growth potential asset class without them actually feeling the downside because effectively from their side, they're feeling that I got it for free. So there's a lot of these like smaller phenomenons that are working on the background that really speak to engagement, that really speak to stickiness, that really speak to the sense that this fintech that I'm engaging with is on my side and helping me with my financial goals. Yeah, no, that I that that point right there, Diego, is like super interesting to me because I've long we 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 talk about tokens so much, um, but we don't often like delineate right. There's like like stable coins. There's also like um, you know crypto monies like ETH and Bitcoin, right? But there's also this class of tokens that are loyalty points, effectively, right? These are not securities. These are these these are the equivalent of like airline miles. Like you do something that the platform wants. And the platform, the network gives you some sort of a bonus. And it feels like, man, the the credit card and the payments industry has done a lot with this over the years. What does this look like in ERC-20 form, in tokenized form, when that's unleashed inside of open finance? And I can't wait to see the experimentation there. I know, you know, some like, um, you know, maybe crypto.com with their their card, they they have some of these things like their CRO token that maybe this resembles some sort of a loyalty point. But but it, it seems to be the case that every every company that wants to reward a network of users is going to want to have some form of of loyalty point credential. Are you seeing much develop in that space? I I would just say that crypto back rewards on card programs is becoming a major, major trend. And I think we started to see this in 2020. And I think for, for consumers, it's as simple as, I didn't get on a plane you know, for a year. And so my existing airline miles just meant less to me because it wasn't something that I was using. Well, and they literally expire, don't they? <laughs> I, and, and I don't even know, because I, I don't know exactly how much an airline mile is worth. And it's hard to track what is the value of that mile. I highly doubt it becomes more valuable. Maybe it becomes less valuable over time and there are restrictions of where I can use it. And when you compare that to being able to earn crypto back and for a consumer who is either already into crypto and excited about it, and they're checking the price every day and they know exactly how much their rewards are worth and they're excited that the rewards could appreciate in value, or for a consumer who may be more risk averse and may say, you know, I'm not ready to invest my money, but it's still fun to have some skin in the game and have some exposure and through the purchases that you make on a card, be earning Bitcoin or another you know, crypto asset back. And so just if you look at the math of if you've been earning one and a half percent back uh, in crypto on your purchases you know, over the past year, you, know, you probably would have paid for many things that you bought. And I think that that's becoming more and more of a mainstream customer value proposition. And at the same time, it's also interesting to think that crypto companies, they have a different business model than a lot of traditional you know, fintechs and, and neobanks. And because of how profitable you know, crypto trading businesses are, they're actually willing to offer even more lucrative rewards in a dollar term than most other programs would. And so I think there's a, a real possibility that if you read the, the Point Sky blog, and you know, if you're one of the, there are people who spend all their time figuring out how to optimize you know, card spend to get the best rewards back, we could look at that you know, nine months to, to a year from now and say the top 10 card programs are all crypto back rewards because they're incentivized to pay out a higher amount to acquire customers, get them into their platform, introduce them to crypto, have them start trading where they can monetize. 
Uh, and because if you factor in the appreciation of the assets that people are earning, you know, it becomes a lot more than two and a half or three percent back. And so we think this is a major, major trend that many of our clients are paying very close attention to and have you know plans to to participate in. And Once then, again, crypto paying you mm-hmm. to use crypto. I think there's an interesting analogy here where the airline miles model, where these companies issue these credits and they use them as incentives. If you want to take the worst, most dystopian future of what a uh, a top down central bank digital currency would look like, where it's restricted based off of like limitations because they want to control you. It's also highly inflationary because they print it out like the worst case of a CBDC actually starts to look like airline miles as we know it today in direct juxtaposition on the other side of the things you have exactly what you guys are talking about with crypto, crypto rewards. So like one, you have the most top down, most controlled, most restricted currency being issued. And then on the other side of things, you have crypto, which is freedom money, if you will, money that appreciates money that's scarce. And so the incentives uh, were exactly what we've been saying of the incentives of crypto actually rewards and incentivizes this sort of behavior. Like no wonder this engagement is being tapped into by these companies. They're starting to put all the patterns together and, and actually formulate products around these things. And uh, I would go to, you know, to, to Ryan's point, it's uh, pretty interesting to see that what is the next step? So Kai's absolutely right. It's uh, we've seen a ton of demand on crypto back rewards because of this component around access to an appreciating asset versus a depreciating asset in the form of miles. But the next step is really the at the core of this uh, Web3 phenomenon and crypto phenomenon, which is, and to quote Chris Dixon, right, Web1 was about read, Web2 was about read, write, and Web3 is about read, write, own. What's happening is that um, these companies are now starting to, instead of just issuing you know, the top assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're giving them rewards of a token that actually will accrue value of the network that is being created. And so it's not that you're just being, you know, rewarded with an asset like Bitcoin that might appreciate in the future. No, you are directly being rewarded by your active participation in this ecosystem. And by participating more, you get more points that represent at some point value of the network that is being created. And so it really speaks to this Web3 read, write, own. You are owning the network that you're creating. And it just creates such strong bootstrapping effects of these networks because you want to talk about your friends about this whatever crypto neo bank that is rewarding me based on the points even though it's not bitcoin and it's not one of the the assets you believe that these points will actually have more value because you believe this network and this service in this particular platform will have more value so that is the next step is really how these companies are using these tokens that they issue to allow clients and consumers to have some of the value of the network that's being created or accrued to them yeah, there's a fascinating potential and component of governance there as well, where you could imagine a future where, you know, today, you know, you might have a card program that has rewards that might rotate in different categories, or you might get different rewards for different merchants. Well, who decides what those categories, what who those merchants are? Well, there's a product manager. And that product manager might have a focus group and they might go out and do some partnerships and they're the rewards that you got. And like you can choose, then they'll look at the data of our consumers, you know, opt again, are they using it? Is it driving Lyft? Versus a community approach where, you know, why don't you ask the customers and imagine if you're earning a token, you know, back on the card, and then that token gives you governance where you then vote on, okay, you know, which categories, you know, should we have rewards in for next month? And you know the people who are the most active users of that card program, who have spent more on that card, have a greater say in the direction that rewards go than someone who's barely used the card. And so I think that there are these really fascinating ways that you can have more community ownership and participation in helping to design these products. And so I think this is still very, very early, but there's a lot that these you know, fintech and crypto native neobanks can, can build on there. Oh my God, the that, DeFi mullet is the best, isn't that, it? <laughs> that fits right into the same themes that we've always been seeing in, in crypto, where once you add in a token, you actually give your community a platform to stand on. And actually, it's a, it turns into a reciprocal relationship between the company and the community rather than a, a top down, like, here's what our products are. Guys, this is in, uh, this crypto industry is inherently a retail-driven industry. The only reason why institutions are here is because retail's here. 
And where previously in the, the legacy world, the TradFi world, uh, the, the, the people, the retail, the communities are very, very separate from uh, a lot of the companies that are like Visa itself or uh, the, the companies that would be something along the lines of Anchorage, like, like custody. But now that we're all in the same, we're all in the same place. But your guys' jobs, uh, Kai at Visa and Diogo at Anchorage, is actually to make things pretty invisible to, to retail, to make to just do a lot of the uh, the hard work and make it behind the scenes and just make it a really good UI. But that also drives a lot of questions. And so, Kai, I have actually a ton of questions about some very basic stuff about payments and how payments work. And so I actually kind of want to start with these very, very broad questions. Kai, when, when Visa is coming into the space, coming into crypto, which is mostly about assets, less about payments, mm -hmm. yet Visa is a payment provider. What do people in the crypto space generally not understand about payments? And then also vice versa. What do people in the payment space not generally understand about, about crypto? Oh, my. Uh, how, how, much, how much time is it do we have? <laughs> try, to, try to think where, where to start. Uh, I think first, it's it's really important to <clears throat> understand that the existing payments ecosystem uh, actually exists in multiple layers, and so the core like Visa Net you know, that you know most people are familiar with today is really this instant you know high throughput authorization system that works at seventy million merchants across the world that can exchange you know messages. You know, between a merchant's bank and a customer's bank. And it enables you to go anywhere in the world that Visa is accepted. And you could be you know, in Spain and at a, a local merchant and have a card issued from a bank in San Francisco. And the problem I think that's, that that's a really important thing I want to delineate just, just real quick right here, where Visa is not an asset transfer network. It is a messaging network where Ethereum and rollups and payment channels, they actually do transfer assets. Visa just transfers messages of approval, messages of authentication. This is correct? So, yes. Yeah, so there's a separation between authorization and settlement. You know, mm -hmm. in Visa's network and you know core payment networks that exist today. And so the, the core problem that it solves is how can you have a merchant that's halfway across the world that you can go to and you can pay with a card that was issued to you by a bank in San Francisco? And that local merchant you know, in Spain doesn't have to question who is this bank that issued this to you? Is, is this bank, what's their financial position? Like, are they actually going to pay me? They just know that there's a guarantee that they're going to get paid, that it's going to work. And so Visa solves that global coordination you know, between over 15,000 banks across the world, both on the consumer side and on the merchant side. And those banks represent 70 million merchants that can now you know, accept cards. However, can I ask the a, a question here, Kai? It's like, because this is really interesting for crypto people. Um, Think of each of the, maybe if we think of each of those individual banks as like chain. independent chains, yeah, chains right? Crushing. And independent ge general ledgers, right? They're all kind of independent. Some are in interconnected in different ways, but they don't really talk to one another. They can't really, uh, you know, transact information. What you're saying is Visa is basically the bridge, the connector, the network on top of all of those disparate chains. Is that a way to think about it in, from a crypto lens? Exactly. That we help 15,000 banks be able to talk to each other in real time, 24-7, all over the world, and be able to have trust in those messages and knowing that they're going to get paid. Now, then you actually have to move the money. And so you can authorize a transaction in real time, but then you have to settle that transaction. And so you have to get money to move from one bank to another bank. And so Visa actually uses you know, dozens of different settlement networks across the world, you know, from Fedwire to a local ACHs and RTP networks, uh, depending on the country, to help coordinate the settlement of funds from one bank you know, to another bank. And so that's where when we look at, at public blockchains today, we really see them, the core use case that we think particularly stablecoins are playing is they are new settlement layers. They're new ways you know, to move funds between two entities. And they have properties that some existing, many existing settlement layers don't have today. 
And one great example that is very practical this week is public blockchains don't have bank holidays. And I got an email yesterday from a crypto company, a crypto card program. Uh, it was actually two days ago. And I think it was smart of them to send this email. They reminded me that if you'd like to add funds to your card, it's a bank holiday for Veterans Day. And you're not going, those, those funds are not going to show up on your card. They wanted to make sure, <laughs> particularly crypto people, it's like, what? Like they were making sure everyone's aware of that. And you don't realize that between now and the end of the year, you know, not only do banks in the US only move money on, on weekdays, but there are actually four weekdays before between now and the end of the year when banks can't actually move money. And so even though you have this global real-time authorization network that can coordinate, you know, 24-7 between banks all across the world, we are constrained in terms of how money can actually move to settle transactions over that network based upon when banks are open and when bank wires can actually be processed. And I think that's what's really interesting about public blockchains is, like I mentioned, we think it's going to be a long time before consumers completely change their the form factor and the behavior of scanning a QR code and that merchants accept it. But we think that there are real problems that public blockchains can solve, making it easier for an issuing bank you know, to be able to settle with Visa, for Visa to be able to settle with an acquiring bank, when we can do it over these public global networks that work 24-7 and don't you know, take holidays off. So Kai, I was trying to, this week, I was trying to actually get uh, funds from one uh, bank account that we have, by the way, you know, Bankless does have a bank account. Unfortunately, we'd really wish, hard out loud. <laughs> okay. So like <laughs> we really wish we could escape the banks, but we still have to pay for like merch and like some of your subscriptions Some you guys pay with, with banks. So we still need to do that. Anyway, I transferred the funds. This is an ACH payment on Sunday. Okay. Uh, it took until today for the bank to actually receive those funds, the the other bank on the other side, so I could you know pay off pay off this credit card basically, um, and it must have been because of that banker holiday. But what was going on? This is an ACH uh, transfer payment. So what's going on behind the scenes is a lot of networks are talking to one another, but ultimately this ACH transfer payment it settles on something called Fedwire, which you mentioned, and this is the settlement layer for banking system for in particular it's it's interesting because this settlement layer i believe is a uh, mono asset so it only s supports us dollars right it is provided by i believe the government or some consortium uh, you know but it's kind of a government provided thing and it is almost like the ethereum for all of the bank chains if you will to settle on top of that's kind of how i think of it is this does this analogy kind of work to you and if so then what you guys are saying is Visa can settle to Fedwire. It can also settle to other settlement networks. But now we're just saying, hey, we can settle ERC-20 stablecoins to Ethereum too. So we're basically just swapping out some of the uh, some of the underlying infrastructure that backs this whole thing. So you know, t test some of these analogies. Is this roughly, am I in the ballpark here? I, I think it's it's definitely in the ballpark. And, and the other important you know, distinction here is this varies based on the country. And that you know these you know tend to be domestic, very local uh, payment rails that central banks uh, and and banks operate, and so it looks different in different countries. And and the U.S. does not have a real time you know payment system uh, that is central bank you know operated. Say the Fed is working on Fed now, and they will in the future. There are other countries you know like Brazil that have you know real time you know payment networks. And so to me, that you know, there are these two things that are happening in parallel. One is a, a, a number of approaches to modernize existing you know, bank-operated uh, payment systems to move to more real-time models uh, from some of the existing models today in the US. Uh, and then to figure out how do you get every country to upgrade and improve their payment infrastructure, and then to connect that payment infrastructure together so that you can do cross-border payments. And then separately in the mullet land, you know, we have these like new open public global networks and many of them that just work everywhere, but there's still fragmentation between them. And how do you cross over, you know, from existing fiat held in a bank account to a stable coin held on an open public network? And so we think it's great that there is 
competition and innovation happening where the development of public blockchains and stablecoins is providing a forcing function saying, hey, like people are starting to think about maybe there shouldn't be bank holidays that I can't move money on. And, and when you have these alternatives, it can then spur kind of more focus on how do you improve existing rails. And I think that you're going to see both of them coexist and solve different problems for different you know, client segments. But it is incredibly complex how money moves today. And I think crypto is bringing a whole new class of entrepreneurs and technologists into really just rethinking what does money movement look like across the world. And um, by the way, one point that I want to make to David's assertion that um, crypto is primarily a retail phenomenon, this is the fork in the road that makes it not to be the case. It was absolutely mm -hmm. primarily a retail phenomenon, but it's no longer just a retail phenomenon. And part of the reasons are because institutions benefit from the rise of stable coins, from the rise of different settlement networks. And, you know, the Visa partnership um, with Anchorage that we have around stable coin settlement uh, it, it's just a great example of that. We see so many of these large fintechs coming to Anchorage because they look at their core business and then they look at stable coins and then they look at the traditional payment system and they look at the T plus two federal holiday, everything. And then they say, hey, there's something here that I can do that is not a consumer product that is highly value accrual to my company, which is I can use these settlement layers to create efficiencies in my own businesses. And we're seeing more and more of these use cases. So the road is forked. Crypto has independent utility for institutions that is not directly related to the fact that consumers want to hold these assets. And so, you know, David, you're absolutely right. That's how the phenomenon started. That's how it evolved. That is still a big portion of it. But we're seeing this fork in the road. And I'm seeing more and more everyday use cases that are very much squarely on the B2B internal settlements, internal efficiency side versus, you know, the consumer support side. Thank you. Crypto is definitely growing up. And, and Diego, I want to pick your brain a little bit about how Anchorage fits into this conversation. Earlier, Ryan talked about how all of these different roll-up chains, you know, all a bank is, is a ledger, right? That's that's what a bank does. It manages a ledger on behalf of its customers. What is a roll-up? What is a blockchain itself? It's another form of a ledger. But now, especially in bull markets, we have all of these extra ledgers. We believe there's a, a blossoming L2 uh, ecosystem that's coming to Ethereum. And uh, notably, uh, Visa is not actually a custodian. It doesn't actually hold any funds. It just messages funds around. Uh, and so what's, what's Anchorage's role in a, in a world where there's many, many different ledgers all over the place and custody kind of needs to happen on every single one? How, what, what's the uh, back end of, of Anchorage look like here? Yeah, at a high level, to continue with these analogies, part of our role is to provide a regulated integration between public ledgers that are on the blockchain and the ability of having fiat on RAM from the traditional world to the crypto world. So it really is a portal. The way that I described Anchorage these days is, yes, we started primarily as a custodian, a regulated custodian, but today we have a federal charter out of which we provide the infrastructure, the APIs, and the prime services for any institution to do custody, to do execution, buy and sell, to do staking, to do governance, to participate in DeFi, to lend, borrow. So it really is the access to institutions to the crypto space. We only work with institutions. We do not have a retail presence. So our clients are folks like Visa, and Kai and I and the team work really um, closely together at kind of like building products that are, you know, B2B, potentially B2B2C, where their clients finally on the other end. But Anchorage is really the infrastructure that is regulated as a bank that has these APIs and these prime services. So you can actually build these types of features on top. And at the end of the day, for us, it doesn't really matter if you're doing, you know, a credit card that is crypto backed credit card, or if you're doing buy and sell for your consumers, or if you are trying to provide staking yields to your consumers or lending yield to your consumers or offering dollars backed by crypto collateral or just an execution play. It doesn't really matter. We have the APIs, the platform regulated as a, a federally chartered bank. Arbitrum is an Ethereum scaling solution that's going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. And now it's live and has over 100 projects deployed. Gas fees on Ethereum L1 suck. Too many people want to use Ethereum and it doesn't have enough capacity for all of us. And that's why teams like Arbitrum have been hard at work developing layer two solutions that makes transactions on Ethereum cheap and instant. Arbitrum increases Ethereum's throughput by orders of magnitude at a fraction of the cost of what we are used to paying. 
When interacting with Arbitrum, you can get the performance of a centralized exchange while tapping into Ethereum's level of security and decentralization. This is why people are calling this Ethereum's broadband moment, where we get to add performance onto decentralization and security. If you're a developer and you want to save on gas costs and overall make a better user experience, go to developers.offchainlabs.com to get started building on Arbitrum. And if you're a user, keep an eye out for your favorite DeFi apps being built on Arbitrum. Many DeFi applications on the Ethereum L1 are migrating over to layer twos like Arbitrum, and some are even skipping over the layer ones entirely and deploying directly on layer two. There's so many apps coming online to Arbitrum, so go to bridge.arbitrum.io now and start bridging over your ETH or any of the tokens listed and start having the DeFi or NFT experience that you've always wanted. Living a bankless life requires taking control over your own privacy keys. Not your keys, not your crypto. That's why so many in the bankless nation already have their Ledger hardware wallet, which makes proper private key management a breeze. But the Ledger ecosystem is much more than just a secure hardware wallet. Ledger is the combination of the Ledger hardware wallet and the Ledger Live app. And if you're used to seeing all of your crypto services and favorite DeFi apps all in one spot, Ledger Live is where you want to be. Not only does Ledger let you buy your crypto assets straight from the app, but it also hooks into all of the DeFi apps and services that you're used to. Using Ledger Live, you can stake your ETH in Lido, swap on DEXs like Paraswap, or display your NFTs with Rainbow. You can also use Wallet Connect inside of Ledger Live to connect to all the other DeFi apps that keep coming online. DeFi never stops growing, and the Ledger Live app grows alongside with it. So click the link in the show notes to see all of the DeFi apps that Ledger Live has, and stay tuned as more apps come online. And if you don't have a Ledger hardware wallet, what are you even waiting for? Go to ledger.com, grab a Ledger, download Ledger Live and get all of your DeFi apps all in one space. Guys, in the beginning of this industry, especially with Bitcoin, Bitcoin was all about, oh, eventually we'll be able to purchase coffee using Bitcoin. That clearly has not has not evolved in that way. And not only, even with the advent of stable coins, we are still are not actually seeing stable coins being used to purchase coffee. I, I believe, Kai, I heard you say somewhere along the lines that the average stable coin transfer is $10,000, meaning like people are doing very different things than purchasing coffee if the average stable coin transfer is $10,000. And so in, in addition to all of these various chains, all these L2s, all these various different ledgers, we also have all these various different currencies. There's USDC, there's USDT. Uh, there's also the coming world of central bank digital currencies. So how does the combination of Anchorage and Visa, where Anchorage is, is the backend custodian, Visa is the payment network, how does that actually span the gap between when I pay with Apple Pay at my local grocery store? Because I, what, I actually don't even know what the currency is that I'm spending at the grocery store. If like I'm spending USDC on the crypto side, what currency am I spending in my normal TradFi? Like I actually don't know these things. How do these world of many currencies, many chains, bridging the way to the typical payments that we're used to or consumer payments, how do you guys as a pair of companies help uh, span this gap? Yeah, so, so maybe I'll start and I think you know, the first, the, the environment kind of pre-crypto and that most people are familiar with is you have you know, many different currencies across the world. Mm -hmm. And you could have a consumer who's spending you know, from a, a, on a card that's issued by a bank and the funds that they have on that card are in one currency. And let's say they're traveling, they're going on vacation, they're spending and the merchant that they're spending at has a bank that's in a different currency. And so you know, what Visa enables is that the issuing bank of the cardholder can settle to Visa, they can send us dollars, and then Visa can send euros you know, to the acquiring bank, the merchant's bank. And so Visa manages conversions between one fiat currency and another fiat currency so that issuers can pay us with their currency of choice, acquirers can, pay, can get paid in their currency of choice to provide you know, to the merchant. Now what we're seeing is not only do we have many different currencies, we now have different form factors of existing currencies. And so when we look at you know, stablecoin you know, like USDC or, or USDP, like this isn't really a new currency. You know, it's still dollars. It's just a new form factor. It's another way to represent those dollars that runs on a different payment rail in a public blockchain. And so in the first example, you know, it's a bank as an issuer that is sending funds in dollars to Visa's bank. And we have many different banks that we work with. And then Visa sends euros from our bank to a merchant's bank that they receive in euros. Now, as we see that this, this landscape of crypto native 
companies that are starting to work with Visa emerge, you know, companies like Crypto.com, uh, where they're building their whole business as this kind of crypto native, you know, card product. Yeah, you know, they're saying, wait a minute, we're holding some of our corporate treasury in USDC. We pay some of our employees in USDC. Like consumers are spending from a balance of crypto or USDC. Why do we have to convert that back into traditional fiat in a bank account just to be able to settle the obligations that we have with Visa? And today we can't receive USDC from one of our clients to a traditional bank because traditional banks don't support USDC. They're not plugged into public blockchains. And so we have integrated Anchorage into Visa's treasury systems as a crypto settlement bank. And so now we have an account at Anchorage where we have a Ethereum address that we can provide to a client and we could say instead of having to send us a bank wire you know, to our you know, existing bank account and paying us in dollars, you can pay us in dollars in the form of USDC that you can send over the public Ethereum blockchain to the account that we have with Anchorage. Now, let's say it's a crypto.com you know, cardholder Crypto.com prefers might prefer to pay us in USDC, but the merchant, their bank doesn't know anything about USDC. They don't know anything about crypto. They they don't they can't receive crypto. And so the same way that you know Visa manages conversions and works with banks to convert dollars to euros, we think we should have the capability to help convert a digital dollar, the form of USDC, into a traditional dollar that we can deliver to a bank. And so we work with Anchorage. Uh, to be able to do that. And we think that this is going to be incredibly important because there's going to be a long transitionary period. I think a lot of people think in these binaries of like, you live in a world of just traditional fiat and bank accounts, or you go completely crypto and like everything is in USDC on public networks. For as long as we can see, there will be traditional fiat and there will be digital fiat. And so how do you have those two work seamlessly together? And have a consumer experience where I don't have to ask and see, does that merchant, do they know what stable coins are? Can they accept them? I pay with my card how I normally do. And everything happens seamlessly on the back end where Visa makes sure that we accept the right form of currency that the, the issuing bank or the crypto card program wants to send us. And that we pay out the right form of currency you know, that the acquirer, uh, the merchant's bank wants to receive. And so Anchorage plays a critical role as a part of our treasury infrastructure to be able to support these conversions between form factors. Do you know, I laugh, Kai, because um, simultaneously, like, you know, one day I'll have to actually write a physical check, like one day of the week, right, to just run the business. And like that same day, I'm just sending money through a crypto transaction. It's like seamless, right? So like even for me, this transition period is like you have to have a foot in both worlds. So I totally understand the value proposition there. Uh, I want to get back to you with with another question, Kai, but before I do, uh, Diogo, do you want to add anything to that about kind of, you know, the role that uh, Anchorage plays or, you know, build off of um, what Kai was saying? Yeah, it's a perfect example of um, us using our platform and our regulated charter and the fact that we're a bank to really bridge traditional world and crypto world so that products like this can be built. I think one of the interesting things here is that we talk about paying with crypto. But the reality is that the consumers don't really care about paying with crypto. And they are final, they, they are the ultimate decision makers of what get, what is successful, what is not successful. It's about convenience. And so the reality is that it's incredibly convenient to use your phone with an Apple Pay or to use your Visa credential in the form of a, um, of a card that you just uh, touch. And it doesn't really matter what the form factor is. At the end of the day, if what you have is a crypto wallet, from which the, the the money is spent, then you are using crypto for payments. And so the the actual technicality of the fact that there is no direct crypto transaction between the final consumer and the actual merchant that you're about to pay for your coffee is irrelevant. And in crypto, we are just very technical in nature. And so we care deeply about the end-to-end transaction happen on the chain, but consumers don't. Their experience is I have a crypto wallet, I have crypto and I spend it at a merchant. Nothing else matters. It's the experience that is the best that ends up winning. It doesn't really matter that it is actually a transaction that is directly on chain. It doesn't matter to the merchant and clearly does not matter to the consumer. So I want to point out that this is what's happening. There is 
crypto being used for payments. Absolutely. But a better proxy is not the number of on-chain transactions that are happening on Bitcoin that are directly settling between a consumer and a merchant. It is really the cards that actually have a relationship with Visa and the volume altogether of cards that are actually backed by crypto uh, crypto on the back end. That is actually the true volume of payments that are being done with crypto. So that is actually should be the shift of us when we monitor crypto adoption for payments. It is not direct settlement is how many cards are being backed by crypto on the back end. Yeah, and, and, and that's just funny. A, just a data point on, on that. I'd say in you know our fiscal year, which you know, ended end of September 30th, uh, we saw over $3 billion of payment volume coming from crypto linked uh, Visa cards. And you know, in the broad wow. scheme of the you know over ten trillion dollars that Visa does, it's very very small. But that virtually didn't exist you know a year and a half, two years ago. You know that that was not in the billions of dollars. And so we see this growing at a very very fast pace. And as more crypto companies issue credentials, as consumers you know find the value prop, particularly with crypto rewards, we think that that's going to become a, a, a very significant number. So Kai, I want to ask this because like, so for many in the crypto industry who've been a believer in what these technologies uh, could bring, we felt sort of like prophets in the wilderness for a while, right? Like just no one believes us. Yeah, there's that crazy guy, you know, whatever. Um, I, and I want to hear about your story because I know you've been a believer in crypto for a while and a champion within Visa for a while. Now you're talking about the value proposition using crypto for, for stable coins as a settlement network like to me at the way you articulate it and point it in three billion in transaction volume like it couldn't be more obvious now the value proposition couldn't be more obvious now and i'm wondering if that's the case within visa um, i'm also wondering about the journey because like that hasn't always been the case and i you know there ha there has to be some some resistance i think from like the old ways of doing things and and kind of the, the the existing established relationships and crypto is kind of a scam and it's for drugs and criminals and it shouldn't be, you know can't be used in this way uh, and public blockchains aren't the future we have private blockchains can you talk a little bit about your journey do you feel like somewhat I guess vindicated and are there still any um, are are there still any objections do you think or is like are is Visa and fintech are they kind of all in on this crypto journey at this point we are definitely all in. Uh, I'd say that you know my journey you know when I came to Visa, you know, I didn't know anything about payments. And so I, I worked at a startup called Trial Pay that that Visa acquired. It was my first job out of college. I was employee number hundred, uh, and I, I was just, what does Visa do? I, I was just learning about Visa as I came into the company, and I happened to go down the crypto rabbit hole with some friends that I was living with in, in San Francisco, and so I had this really unique opportunity to learn about Visa and payments and learn about crypto at the same time. And that was, you know, really, this was a, a, a 2017 mullet uh, environment where you know, I was the only, that was before bullets were cool. I was the only person <laughs> They were not mullet. cool in 2017. <laughs> where, where the famous. weird guy in the office. <laughs> it, it, it was looking at, there were people that I got to learn from at Visa who'd been at Visa for, for 30 years. They knew everything about payments. I'm like, I'm never going to know more about existing payment systems at Visa than they do. But they didn't know anything about crypto. They just hadn't spent any time on it. They kind of, you know, they either you know, just didn't, they didn't care or it just wasn't that interesting to them. And then I was spending time with people in crypto who knew everything about crypto. I was like, I'm never going to know as much as you do about crypto. <laughs> but they didn't know anything about Visa. And so it was, was very clear that the future is going to be some intersection of the two. And so I decided I want to spend the next decade of my career trying to build, you know, at that intersection. And we made a little bit of progress every week for four years. And, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's amazing that, that when you do that, how much uh, can happen. And I think it's also, you know, along with the entire industry moving, uh, Visa is very much a, you know, partner driven company. You know, we've, we've got tens of thousands of partnerships. Like we really rely and we coordinate between fintechs and banks and, and merchants. And so as our partners started to care about crypto, you know, we start to care about crypto and say that this is important. When our, you know, some of our most forward-thinking, innovative, um, you know, partners are, are deeply investing in it, it was very natural that that we wanted to to be alongside them and and help and find ways that that we can add value. And so, you know, I was just the the annoying crypto person uh, inside the company, just talking about it, you know, every single day. Oh, we've all and, been there. <laughs> And I actually, one of the things I did, I, I, I created a newsletter I called Visa Crypto Weekly. 
uh, that I started probably like, I think it was beginning of 2018. And I strategically sent it out on Sunday nights. Uh, Cause I was like, you know, people are more likely to check their email and read a few things on like Sunday night than like Monday or Tuesday. And it, it started with 10 people who were just curious about crypto uh, within the company. And over time, you know, we grew it to, I think we, when we stopped, it was at 500 people. Uh, and so it was just trying to really focus on education. And I think the more people learn about crypto, the more that you can explain it and translate it in the context of Visa and the context of payment systems, the more natural that it was that, of course, we should be involved. And I think also Visa as a company, we've really evolved from, you know, we used to, Visa the company was Visa Net the card network. But over the past few years, it's really been about how do we become this global payment infrastructure company and participate and add value to many different payment flows. So what about, you know, the hundred trillion dollars of B2B payment flows? That's a huge opportunity that we could start to participate and add value in. And so we see ourselves as kind of this network of networks. And how can we be a connection point for clients to move value over all different networks that emerge in the future? And so that's a much broader perspective than just the card business. And I think that's where the opportunities for crypto, particularly stable coins, if stable coins are going to become better bank wires, we would love to be able to, to be at the forefront of helping our clients leverage stable coins for some of those use cases. So I've had a lot of fun and I've gotten a ton of support internally. And, and at this point, we are all in. We are in the crypto business. We are very excited you know, about the opportunities that it presents for us. By the way, for bankless listeners, there's probably some hidden career advice here. Anytime you can serve as a nexus and bridge two worlds together, you will do very well, particularly when one of these worlds is growing so fast. So I know David and I are always telling you, hey, quit your job, come join crypto, come join us on the journey. There's also the possibility within your existing company, within your existing role, you can serve as a bridge to crypto in all aspects, whether it's finance or the metaverse or NFTs or otherwise. Uh, anyway, keep that keep that in your hat, listeners. I hope you picked up on that. Kai, I want to go down a very quick, hopefully short rabbit hole, but usually these rabbit holes aren't that short. Uh, with regards to payments in the in the traditional world, payments are more far more reversible than in crypto. So, how does the immutability of these transfers on uh, on actual blockchains does that like ease any frictions for Visa? Does that add any problems? How does that change the game when it comes to payments in Visa? So when in, in the context that you know, we are working with Anchorage uh, and you know, it really focused on using USDC and public blockchains as settlement layers, it, it's, it's not a, a, a major issue because you know, Fedwire and you know, other large settlement rails, like, uh, they, they are not easily reversible and you have to be very careful when you use them. So I, I don't think there's a, a huge you know, distinction there. I think there is an important question for consumers about you know reversibility, and I think that you know there is a a, a value proposition of card products um, to be able to know that you know if you sign up you know for a subscription you know with you know a website online, and if you literally can't cancel that subscription, and you know they keep charging your card, like there's someone you could call, and you could have you know that that charge canceled, and and you could be able to you know have have some recourse an ability to, to get your, your money back. And I think that that solves a, a real problem in, in a number of different use cases, where if you switch entirely to, you know, you're going to make payments for everything in stable coins, you know, it'd be like you're going to use bank wires for, for everything. Uh, and there are certain payments where that makes sense and, and others where you want to be able to, to have some, some recourse. And so I think, you know, what's exciting to me is that there's just so much innovation happening and there'll be different products across the spectrum. And if someone wants to go entirely crypto native, they can, but there are trade-offs. <laughs> there, there is no clear, here's the product that you use that is better on every single metric you know, for both consumers and merchants. And so you know, we're excited to be able to offer products that are very easy for merchants to accept because they already accept them today and very easy for consumers to use that provide some benefits and guarantees uh, and recourse that consumers have, which we think will continue to be valuable, particularly for people who are scared of, you know, don't get the address wrong. Like, you know, mm -hmm. what if you're scanning a QR code? And what if there's a new type of attack and someone, there's a man in the middle and they put their QR code in there and you send them your stable coins? You're not getting that back. And so I think there's a long way to go 
to have crypto native payments to the core of paying over a blockchain be as convenient and consumer friendly as card payments are right now. And, you know, a lot of people in crypto, we get so focused on the tech, we don't think about, you know, an average consumer and, and what they care about is, you know, being able to trust that the payment's going to go through. And, you know, if there's some issue, having someone to be able to call. And I think that's a, a major problem that, that card solved today. But, but David, to your point, I think your antics are absolutely right, not for the payments use case, but it is very clear that many fintechs that come to us that have some kind of uh, consumer funding that they are dealing with T plus two, they are dealing with finality problems of networks like ACH, uh, they are dealing with these issues because it is a, a consumer, a bad consumer experience to fund an account and then have to wait five days for it to actually be withdrawable. And we see this constantly on exchanges where funds can might be used immediately, but they can't actually be withdrawn. And all of that has to do with the network lack of finality and with the reversibility and the fact that they can be clawed back. So there's many other types of use cases for which the fact that, you know, when the RC20 token is final, well, probabilistic in nature, but, you know, with strong probabilistic <laughs> conviction um, from a stochastic model of number of confirmations. We believe that it's there. It can't be clawed back. It can't be taken away. This is actually a, a major shift. And it's interesting because because of this issue, we have created a whole market and a whole set of complex systems that companies like Square and Stripe do around underwriting. They are dealing with a system that will only guarantee them that the money will be theirs, um, you know, X days from now. Yet they underwrite for that period of time using their own risk models, uh, the ability of uh, paying immediately, or in the case of Square Cash, being able to do an instant payout and actually withdraw the money immediately, when in fact, they're liable and they're taking on the risk there. So there's a whole complexity to risk analysis and underwriting of these types of use cases because the systems do not have uh, instant finality. And there's many use cases, by the way, in the traditional financial world where people say, why is this T plus two? Why can't we have a blockchain do this instantly? There's many use cases for which the financial institutions actually want those two days. They want those two days to have the time to do something in case it goes wrong. And so it's part of their built-in risk model. So they'll actually push back because they don't want the technology to be instant. But there's many use cases for which consumer experiences are just so much better when you're using something with instant finality. Because if I can guarantee that in a few minutes, all the funds are there and they're, they're not encumbered in any way, shape or form, and I don't actually have to run a very complex underwriting process to allow those funds to be used, then that's just a dramatically better product experience which ultimately makes a company distinguish themselves from their competitors. I think one very practical example and use case uh, you can think about is like you know, paying your credit card bill, where you're paying your credit card bill with an ACH uh, bank transfer from your bank account. Let's say someone is like right up to the limit of their credit card. They're about to max their, their credit card out and they want to be able to, to pay that out and, and get access to it. Well, there's some risk that what if that payment doesn't go through? It could take several days. And so you might have an issuer say, hey, we're, we're going to wait to make sure that payment goes through before we're going to give you more of a credit line. And so that's where it's exciting to me to say, well, what if you could pay your credit card bill with a stable coin? And there's instant finality where that issuer can know that they have that money. And so at any point of time, you know, if you want to create, you know, have more credit, uh, more of a credit limit, you can pay down your credit card you know, instantly, you know, with a stable coin instead of having to wait, you know, a few days for a payment to post via ACH. And so I think there are like really interesting ways that that can come together. Kai, that, that literally just happened to me this week. Okay. <laughs> it's like, I was wait, waiting for five days and like our merch wasn't shipping because I was just trying to transfer some funds to a credit card to pay off a balance. And I would have loved to have just pressed a button and sent that in ERC-20 stable coin. And there's a lot of these points of friction throughout all of our daily experiences. And so the way that I think about this is just another tool in your toolbox. If you are an institution, if you're a fintech, if you're a company trying to build some type of product where money is being moved, then you want to consider this as a tool in your toolbox. You might consider the traditional financial world. If you're directly access to Fedwire, maybe you don't actually have uh, concerns about finality, but for everybody else, not a lot of people have direct access to Fedwire, then this is a tool in your toolbox that you might actually use. Guys, there's a, we definitely want to get to the CBDC conversation, but I want to speed run us through this NFT conversation because recently Visa purchased a CryptoPunk. So congratulations for, for owning a CryptoPunk. Uh, and I want to go through the story of how that process happened. Kai, why did Visa decide to actually buy a CryptoPunk? Uh, and what did you learn from that experience? What was the goal of that? And then also we'll fit in how Anchorage helped out in that process as well. 
so so I think what's really exciting about you know NFTs for us is that Visa has been around for 60 years. And so, you know, we have you know, participated in major commerce transformations, you know, over that time. And so you can think about, you know, first, you know, the, the origins of Visa, it's, you know, you're selling physical goods in a physical location. And we helped to move that from cash and check to an electronic uh, payment. You know, then you go to, now there's this internet and you could do e-commerce. And so now, you know, you're selling, you know, with a digital storefront. You don't have to pay rent anymore and like have an open location, but you're still mostly selling physical goods. You still have a factory, you're still manufacturing, you're still shipping, uh, and the storefront is digital and the payment is digital or electronic. Now we see NFTs as this, you know, really brand new phase of commerce where it's a digital storefront and it's an entirely digital product uh, that you're selling. And we think that the potential that this has to just increase the velocity of commerce is tremendous. When you can sell something to someone across the world and have it minted uh, instead of produced in a physical factory, and then have it delivered to a crypto address instead of shipped to a mailing address, and have that happen instantaneously, and then have whoever receives it be able to own it and resell it if they'd like to someone else all across the world. The number of transactions and the amount of commerce that can happen, we think could be you know beyond anything that we've ever seen before. And so that's when just NFTs are a new generation of e-commerce that has tremendous potential, but we want to help make it easier. And so we want to help merchants and brands be able to figure out how to sell NFTs. We think consumers should be able to buy them with a Visa card on file you know, as easy as buying anything else on e-commerce. And so we are very much focused on how do we help accelerate the adoption you know, of this category of commerce. But to do that, like we need to deeply understand it. Uh, and so you know, that was the, the goal for us is let's just learn by doing. And, and we've been very focused on building a crypto native culture at Visa. You know, we like to experiment. We believe that the only way to truly understand and learn about crypto is to use it. And so everyone on our team uses crypto. Like that is a core part of, you, you just can't figure out, you know, what impact crypto is going to have in your business if you've never set up a wallet. The same way you wouldn't have been able to figure out what impact the internet's going to have in your business if you never had a dial-up connection and you never surfed the web. And so recognizing that it's early, you still have to go in and experiment. And so that's what we wanted to do, you know, purchasing the CryptoPunk. You know, we knew CryptoPunks were this historic artifact you know, that was one of the first mainstream successful uh, NFT projects. And we're like, we should collect this the same way that Visa collects, you know, old, you know, first generation card processing machines and kind of cufflinks that DHOC handed out. We've got this whole archive of really cool things that we've collected. We're like, CryptoPunks deserve a spot. And so, you know, we wanted to add it to our archives. We want to display it in all of our innovation centers, you know, in our offices and have it as a part of, of Visa's collection. But we're like, how do we do this? How do we buy this as an institution? And so I ended up you know, sending a, a, a message to Diogo and I was like, hey, like, we want to buy a crypto pump. <laughs> like, can, can you help us with this? And, and we went down many different paths of, you know, it would be very, very difficult for a large institution like Visa to do it on our own. Uh, and so that's where you know it, Anchorage really stepped up and were an amazing partner. And it's one of the reasons why we chose them in the first place is because of their ability to execute on new initiatives like this. So maybe Diogo, you could talk about kind of how you actually did it uh, and you know the role that that you played in it. I mean, starting from the receiving a text from Kai, I don't know. I think it was 2 a.m. or something. I don't know what, what Kai's doing at 2 a.m. thinking about these initiatives. Uh, did, but, did he have the CryptoPunk selected at that time? Or was it like just like, hey, I've got you know possibilities. I got a budget for one. What, did, did you guys have your heart set on one? It was more like we had, I had identified a buyer I, or I identified a seller. Uh, and ah. so a seller that had a collection of CryptoPunks. So we were kind of limited to what selection they had. So to us, it was more about we need a punk. Uh, like, yeah. you know, at this point, any punk is like amazing to have. And so how can we work with this known seller and Anchorage to, to help do And it, it's interesting because if you're an institution, the types of things that you're thinking about are very different from a consumer experience, right? Obviously, the 
where do I keep this thing in a way that it will be there, um, in a way that is uh, potentially regulated, in a way that minimizes my risk of not just loss, but my risk of having something bad happen to it. But from another perspective, consumers don't usually care about who they're buying their art from, and institutions kind of do. And so from a perspective of who's the, who's the buyer, uh, do we know who they are? Um, you know, where this source of funds is, you know, all of the, all of the, all of this until how do we pay for this? How do we get the Ethereum to actually pay for this? How do we execute and turn fiat into Ethereum? And uh, how do we settle this transaction? How do we take ownership of it? And how do we store this for the long term? So there's a, quite a few things institutions need to think about, quite a few things that uh, you have to consider from a risk perspective until you actually get this done. So from my perspective, what I did was I received a text Kai said, hey, we want to buy a CryptoPunk. And we're like, I was not thinking of having a, an NFT product. That is not part of my roadmap. Uh, but, you know, let's let's do this. This sounds fun. So I think the end-to-end, Kai, I mean, keep me honest here, but end-to-end, it was like two weeks, a week and a half to two weeks, yeah. end-to-end from first text of, I, I have an idea to we have a punk and we can announce it. And we have a specific punk and it's been purchased and been settled. The interesting thing here is that the moment we announced uh, that Visa had bought a punk and that Anchorage had helped, Every single one of my clients and every single one institution out there with, with CryptoPunk and their NFT just reached out to us. So now we actually have no quite a bit of a treasure trove and a significant percentage of all the punks on the market. Um, no way. No way. Custody. That's yeah. fantastic. Hey, thank you for uh, increasing the core price of CryptoPunk. Yeah, David says as he uh, looks at his punk in the background. <laughs> no, that's it's it's a beautiful punk, by the way. So thank congratulations. You. Ryan's it was ugly, and I took one offense of the to most that. It was one of the most effective you know, marketing initiatives that we've done, really just raising awareness of, of Visa participating in this space. And I think what we found is like the same way that it was crazy to think in the early days of, of Twitter and Facebook that you'd have major brands on these new platforms talking directly to consumers. We think there's a parallel of you know, being able to have an institution or a brand collect NFTs and have an NFT collection that fits with that brand's identity. And using that to build relationships authentically with these communities that are forming around NFTs, we think is is a a new way to to do kind of social media management uh, and and marketing. And so that was really exciting to us. But we wanted to make sure it was authentic. Yeah, you know, we didn't want to just come in and say, "Let's do a Visa NFT drop." And hey, everyone, Visa selling an NFT. We wanted to say, like, let's pay homage to the role that these historical you know, valuable projects have played in the communities that they've built. And let's say we see you and let's help introduce you to the rest of the world and use that to inspire others to say, you know, build on these new technologies and these these new form factors. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad you did it. I mean, to, to many in the crypto industry, to me, it was like a signal. It was basically like, hey, crypto, you know, Visa's here. We're crypto native. We, we know what's going on, right? So that was a signal and stuff. And the second signal was like, uh, oh my God, Visa must really trust Kai and the crypto Visa team, right? To to, to be able to get the budget for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar crypto punk. So you guys have definitely earned some legitimacy and credibility internally, and that's a signal in and of itself. Guys, we don't have too much more time, but we want to touch upon this at least. And this is uh, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. Okay, so China has a strategy. We had a gentleman by the name of Richard Turin on. Uh, he wrote a book called um, uh, Cashless. He told us all about China. China's strategy, and basically they're letting their um, tech companies eat their banking system, okay? So like the, the WeChats and the Alipays are doing that. And um, one benefit of that is they've been able to roll this out across a very broad population, mobile payments, QR codes. You mentioned that a few times. It's all QR codes. It's very easy, very accessible. Uh, payment fees, transaction fees are down to like a you know f- fraction of a percentage for each transaction. A lot of good things. Um, crypto, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency industry would say, yeah, but the trade off is complete centralized control. Okay. Like you don't have the freedoms. There's no property right uh, concept in this. And so I want to ask the question to you guys because Visa is sort of feels like it's in the center of it. And definitely, Diego, the institutions are as well. What strategy do you think the US will ultimately pursue? in the central bank digital currency realm? Will it go the way of China? Will it go a public-private type relationship? Or will it continue to do what I feel like it's doing, which is like shrug its shoulders and not really very Spin much? Spin wheels, yeah. Spin wheels. What's your take here, uh, Kai? So, so I think first, China is a, a very unique uh, you know, country and, and market you know, for payments. And so it's, it's, 
very hard to draw direct parallels from China to, to every other market. And I think you know, it's very clear CBDC is a, a major focus for them. Reportedly, they started in 2014. You know, they've got you know a lot of engineers. They've got like 100,000 engineers building complex infrastructure. And so this is very real in, in China. Uh, then you have the rest of the world looking at this and saying, what should we do? And we think it's going to have to be more of a, a public private partnership for them to be successful. And I think first too often, you know, one of my frustrations has been the conversation around CBDC and stable coins and how to regulate stable coins is kind of happening in a vacuum. People are like just focused on CBDC and like, how do you design CBDC? It's very academic and abstract and like, you know, what are the monetary policy implications? And then it's, oh, okay, how do you regulate stable coins? where we think stablecoins represent this really interesting environment where you can see what are the use cases? What demand do, do consumers and, and businesses have for a digitized form of their fiat currency? And increasingly, it's not to buy their coffee. Like <laughs> I think that's been one of the challenges with CBDC is what problem does it solve for consumers? And what does CBDC look like as a product? And that's something we're very focused on, and, and we're engaging with you know, every major central bank across the world, you know, doing research and helping them think through this. But how do you position it? You know, how do you differentiate it from a bank deposit? You know, who can offer a CBDC wallet? I think that's a critical question. Is it only a bank that can offer a CBDC wallet? Like only banks can have you know, accounts at, at the Fed? Or is it any fintech or developer can build a CBDC wallet? And I think what has made stablecoins so exciting is this developer ecosystem, is the composability, is the new use cases like DeFi and NFTs that have really you know, driven it forward. And so I would argue that for CBDC to be successful, it has to have many of the same properties that stablecoins have had. And there are paths, and the IMF has talked about this concept of synthetic CBDC, where you know, you could you know have a stablecoin that's backed by reserves you know at a central bank, but still have it run across you know multiple different networks. And so, I think that we are still very very early, and there's a lot of work to do on what are the use cases. Uh, you know, what does it look like as a product? What role do banks play? What role do payment companies play? And so we're we're really committed to just being a partner to central banks to help them think through it, and frankly help them learn a lot from the stable coins and the existing private sector initiatives. Diogo, what's your take on the same question? How will central bank digital currencies turn out in the US? I think, as we all know, there's a spectrum between decentralization and full centralization. CBDCs definitely, as we know, live on the, on the right side of the spectrum in terms of full centralization. I think invariably what comes out of a CBDC is going to be positive for crypto. I do agree that it needs to have the characteristics around transparency and around access that stable coins do. And if they don't, then it'll just likely look like more of a Fedwire V3 than really um, a cryptocurrency as we know it. And so that is the likely outcome here. And I think the regulators are talking about who has a, a CBDC account and can consumers have direct uh, relationships with the banks. That's actually one of the biggest conversations that is being had more that and less about the technology, less about the openness. But our role at Anchorage is going to be bridging these worlds. Uh, if there is a CBDC then, and if there is a transparency and ability for us to have access to it, maybe we can be the ones to wrap it and actually have it be available to all of these other networks, whether it's Solana and Ethereum, et cetera, and have a central bank digital currency that is also exposed in crypto and can be used by smart contracts. So that's, I feel like, a really good outcome that is in between these two worlds. It's not a full cryptocurrency, but it gets to benefit smart contracts by having a Federal Reserve backed um, proxy and deposit, but still be available on smart contracts. And so I think that would be a great outcome uh, for, for us if, if it does pan out. Kai, Diego, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you guys. Thank you for taking us through the DeFi mullet. I want to conclude with this question. So some of the crypto natives listening to this might be a bit skeptical, okay, because crypto natives uh, come from the ethos of decentralization, right? The cypherpunk ethos. And here's Visa, which is a centralized company. And here's Anchorage, which is, you know, serving the institutions. And they're getting in on the crypto space too. Uh, put their 
mind at ease. Like we've talked about all of the wins for institutions and the fintechs in crypto. What are the wins for crypto natives in having some of these institutions and established fintechs come to their world? What's your take, Kai? Yeah. So, so first, I would highly recommend you know anyone who is deep into crypto go and learn a little bit about DHOC. And learn a bit of it about the origins and the history of Visa. And I think what you'll find, uh, D. Hawk predicted a lot of the things that we've seen in crypto in the '60s, in the '70s. D. Hawk, you know, talked about decentralization, talked about new types of of organizations, and and kind of precursors to DAOs. And and so there are these components that are kind of in Visa's history and core DNA that just has a lot of parallels to to what crypto looks like today. Now, I think one of the major roles that we play is you know, for crypto to continue to grow and to become mainstream, you know, it needs to be convenient for consumers to be able to, to access. Uh, we want to be one of the best on-ramps into crypto where you can easily buy with a Visa debit card. And so we think that's a major, major role that we can help play for the industry uh, to move funds you know, into crypto and then to let consumers be able to get back out and, and spend it at, at merchants. And so you know, we think that we can accelerate, you know, the growth and adoption of crypto across the world in a way that very few organizations can. And we're absolutely committed to doing that. Diogo, what's your take? Same question. Yeah, I think there is a common question for, for us, which is in a world where self-custody and be your own bank is part of the ethos and how things were created, why would I use a platform that is centralized around a traditional Delaware C-Corp? And the answer to that is that you're focusing on the wrong aspect. It really is not about centralization, decentralization. I believe it is around the gatekeepers. In the traditional world, there are gatekeepers to access fiat and allow you to transfer fiat. In crypto world, as long as there are no gatekeepers, as long as you can integrate directly with Ethereum and Bitcoin, and Anchorage does not allow you to, this cannot stop you from doing so, then we still have the ability of doing self-custody and people will still be able to always do it while benefiting from the fact that Anchorage is specialized. It is not centralization, it's specialization. The reality is that very large institutions and even consumers really can't do the type of uh, custody that is necessary for private keys that are completely irrecoverable and are storing trillions of dollars. And so I think it's a lot more about specialization than centralization. And as long as these companies can allow the permissionless innovation that has happened in crypto over the past 12 years and can't act as gatekeepers to these networks, then these things are not against the ethos. It is not self-custody or centralized custody. It is about both. You can keep some of your assets on your own and you can keep assets on a centralized entity that is specialized in doing the right thing. Then finally, I just want to say that institutions do have legal requirements to use third-party custodians. And Anchorage is the only unambiguous qualified custodian in the United States because of our OCC chartered bank. And so sometimes these entities don't even have a choice. They can't really do self-custody. Not only they don't have the technical talent and the ability, but they can't from a regulatory perspective do it. Fantastic. Guys, thank you for guiding us through the DeFi mullet. It's been an absolute pleasure. Kai, Diogo, take care. Thank you for having us. Guys, fantastic conversation. Action items for you today. We will include a link in the show notes to view Visa's CryptoPunk so you can see what that looks like. Also, Kai was mentioning uh, D. Hawk. That is the founder of Visa. You can read all about D. Hawk. We will include a link in the show notes. Um, I want to do some reading on him myself. Maybe he has some crypto native values as well. We'll also include a link to their recent Visa's recent interoperability white paper. The last thing, of course, you can do is become... A triple point consumer of Bankless. That means you're listening to the podcast now. Also subscribe on YouTube and the newsletter. That is the trifecta for the Bankless journey. It's exactly what you need. Of course, risks and disclaimers. None of this has been financial advice. Not at all. ETH is risky. Bitcoin is risky. So is crypto. All of it's risky. You could lose what you put in. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. 
We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.